so um, so we use uh, as in vision we use it to look at what the edges are what the what the textures by by uh, feeling what the texture of the object is you determine uh, uh, what what the object is uh, you can if it was a uh, the, uh, the, the, the boot was identified as a boot. Um, and these, this is done with uh, res these receptors here, these odd receptors. And this is this, the very surface of the skin, and this is deeper within the skin. And you can see some of these receptors, these ones here, are at the surface, including hair receptors. Hair receptors have these things surrounding them. So when anything touches the hair, that activates the receptor. And these ones deeper here uh, feel other aspects of touch. And the first, first one of these is, is called the, the Piscinian afferent or receptor. Now, don't worry about all these names. We'll give them another name in a moment, and uh, and so you don't have to remember these strange things. Now, how does the, the Pacinian receptor work? Well, first of all, you get something presses on your skin, and you, in the case of this receptor, um, you get indentation of the skin, and that deforms these sort of onion-like uh, surround on this receptor here. This is the, the receptor, and this is the axon then that goes to the brain. And when, when you have that deformation, that opens up a channel within the receptor, and that allows sodium to flow into the cell. Sodium has a positive uh, charge on it, and that charge raises the potential within uh, the receptor. And if that uh, voltage reaches a certain level, it then sets off an action potential, and that action potential travels down the axon. Now, in this particular axon, we've got these myelin uh, sheaths around it. They surround um, parts of the axon and sort of insulate it. It's a, it's a, myelin is a fatty substance, and it uh, provides insulation. So the axon now jumps from gap to gap, and that speeds it up. So any receptor that's myelinated um, Uh, is a fast uh, conducting receptor. Um, you don't have to know this for the exam, but if you have MS, for example, multiple sclerosis, um, what happens is this, this myelin starts disappearing and the conduction down your axon starts to fail. Now, when pressure is exerted on the skin, that uh, changes the potential inside the, the receptor. And if the um, potential is above a certain threshold, you get action potentials occurring. Okay. And if it's a little bit of pressure, you, ha you can be below threshold. If it's above threshold, axons fire. And if it's way above threshold, more axons fire. So the axon uh, frequency is one of the things that uh, tells you how much pressure is being applied. Now, the other thing that you can see here is that the action, even though the pressure remains constant, 
the action potential is just occur briefly for a brief time. And this is because this particular receptor is rapidly adapting. Okay? So you can see the potential drops quickly within the receptor, even though the pressure remains constant. Now, how does that happen? Other receptors we'll see are slowly adapting, so this thing stays fairly constant for a long time in those receptors. The other thing that, 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 that happens is that as the pressure increases, the pressure that's being exerted on the skin, the number of action potentials increase, but not in linearly. As you get to the t over here in the top, the, the increase in the number of action potentials isn't as great as the increase that occurs here at the lower pressures. So you're less sensitive to a change at the higher pressures than at the lower pressures. And you'll find in one of the uh, practice problems this, this week uh, why that is a good thing. Now, why does it uh, why do you have uh, something uh, adapt, in this case, uh, rapidly adapt? Well, one of the reasons is that, as you saw uh, at the beginning, uh, this pressure occurs. These um, onion-like coverings on the receptor, they spring back to their former position, and that closes this channel, and the, action, the potential then goes back down, and the action potential stops. And why that happens is because, um, in, um, on, on this, as in the case of uh, uh, vision, sometimes you don't just care about the change that's happening, but it's especially true uh, with the sense of touch. You want to know if something's changing on your skin, that is, like a bug that's crawling on your skin, you don't care so much about the sense of the clothes that you're wearing. You know, you put, put a shirt on or a sweater on, and it, it, it doesn't matter as long as it stays the same. Everything is, is uh, the, the, the brain needn't be informed about. So changes are what are, what are important, and that's why the receptors have uh, are rapidly or slowly adapting um, way. Now, on the skin, you have these four different types of receptors, uh, five different types of receptors, but on any part of the skin, you have either the hair or this Meissner receptor, but not both. Okay, so like on the on the back of my hand. Um, you have hair receptors. On the palm of my hand, I don't have hair receptors. So I have these Meissner receptors instead. Now, you don't have to remember what, uh, what these are called. The important thing to remember is that some of them are slowly adapting and some of them are rapidly adapting. RA stands for rapidly adapting, SA stands for slowly adapting. And then we uh, add the number one, if they, as you see here, they're close to the surface, or number two, if they're deeper in the surface. And you notice that on any part of the body, you'll have uh, at least two receptors close to the surface, one rapidly and one slowly adapting. And deep in the skin, you'll have the same thing. One slowly adapting, one rapidly adapting. So you can forget about those names. Just remember um, that, that at, at the top you have both rapidly and slowly, and deep what you have rapidly and, slow, and slowly. The other thing that, that, that uh, 
is is um, interesting is that uh, uh, the receptive field size changes. So if you have um, receptors close to the top of the skin, their receptor size is generally small. Those that are deep within the skin have receptor sizes that are much larger. Now, uh, you, you remember from the, the vision lecture that with only three types of tones, you can distinguish with, between something like two million colors. Well, here we have uh, at least four. Um, and um, uh, you can imagine how many shades of touch these four can distinguish. That's an amazing number. And it's with the, that amazing number uh, of, of different touch abilities that um, we could discover what was in that bag without seeing it. Now, in addition to touch receptors, we have um, other types of receptors. One of them is pain receptors. In the case of pain receptors, we have one that you can see here is not myelinated and one over here that is myelinated. That conducts, this one conducts fast and this one conducts slow. And this one is, the fast one is sort of an, a sense of pain that's early and localized to particular spot and is intense. It also mediates itching. The other one uh, arrives much later and it's more poorly localized. And as you can see here, it lasts longer and it's sort of a dull pain. Now, the, one of the other things that happens in the sense of uh, touch is that um, um, you're, you're, you can put pressure on your uh, axons, and that pressure can cause uh, the, the, the axon to not be able to propagate the action potential. Now, pressure, when pressure is applied, it's the large fibers, the ones that mediate touch, that are first affected. But uh, sometimes these smaller fibers that mediate um, pain, as we saw uh, before, and um, we'll see in a moment, temperature, they're, they're still uh, can be activated. They're still preserved. Now, in the case of pain, uh, we have something like um, uh, called the gate control theory, which was proposed by Patrick Wall and Ronald Melzack. And they suggested uh, pain is dependent on a balance between the large fibers of touch and the small fibers mediating pain. Um, and if there's more large than small, uh, we don't feel pain. But if it's the opposite, we sense pain. And that's why, why sometimes when you do feel pain, but you rub the skin, um, you seem to alleviate the pain. Now, besides pain, you have another uh, type of affect, which measures whether something is hot or cold. And again, um, uh, these are myelinated, so they're fairly fast conducting. Um, but neither of these um, measure burning or freezing. Both burning and freezing 
are mediated by pain receptors. This just tells you whether things are, are hot or cold. Now, how do things, how does these axons tell you whether things are hot or cold, painful, not painful, whether it's something smooth or... Um, all the brain gets is these action potentials arriving in, in your cortex. So it could be something that's rapidly adapting, uh, something that's vibrating on your skin, could be something that's slowly adapting and pressing on, on your skin for a longer time, like some sort of steady pressure. It could be something small, just on the skin surface, or it could be something deep that's pressing hard on the skin. Now, for the brain, to know what's being, what's going on, it somehow uh, puts labels on each of these afferent types. So it has a label for each one. And that's something like happens on the internet. Here we have somebody sending messages and somebody receiving messages. And you can see that the, this person here is given a red code, and this person here is given a green code, and this decoder here separates those red, green, or blue uh, messages out to the proper person that this person was sending it to. So that's called a labeled line. Well, the brain also uses a labeled line, but it does it in a different way. It has a separate axon for each type of receptor. Okay? So this receptor has its own private line. This receptor has its own private line. And for that, you need a fairly thick spinal cord to send that message up to your brain needs lots of lines. Now, we developed this, the, these um, labeled lines um, largely by um, experience. So a child uh, will touch things and, and, and uh, discover what, what the sense of smoothness is, what the sense of something being rough is, uh, something warm or cold. Uh, th these labels are learned during one's life. Now, the fact that um, you sense something is cold because a particular receptor is being activated um, uh, is, is, is not any different from um, you'll see in the auditory system. A particular afferent is firing and you'll sense that a, a certain frequency, a, a certain pitch is being heard. Um, in the sense of your vision, a, a certain cone type was being activated, and you sense from that a certain that that object is a certain color. So again, it's it's uh, which afferent is being activated that provides that sense, and uh, its firing frequency is not what. Uh, gives that information, it, it uh, tells you how much of it, that information is being sent down. So if, for example, this afferent were being activated, you'd recognize after uh, experience this for some time, 
that some sort of localized flutter, and that could be an insect. If this afrod was firing, you'd find it, you'd, you'd sense it was some sort of fine vibration, and you could use it to recognize texture. We'll talk more about recognizing texture in a moment. If this afrod is firing, it's a slowly adapting fiber, so you know it's something that's lasting for a long time, and the slowly la uh, adapting fiber is at the surface of the skin, so it's activated by something that, 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 that has a small receptor field, and you can sense the details from it, like whether um, the coin was round or, or an object which was, um, that chair was um, sort of, or the, the, the um, uh, dice was square. Uh, this one here is activated um, by skin stretch. So if I, as I curl my hand, uh, I stretch the, the skin on the outside of my hand and compress it on the inside of my hand. And from that sensation of, of, of stretch and compression, I can tell things like how far my fingers are apart. And one of the important clues that you had when you uh, sensed that the cube was a cube was being able to tell that bo both sides were the same uh, dimension and that you could tell that different coins by how close your fingers were together when you pressed on those coins. So uh, that ability to, to measure how far your fingers are apart is an important clue of what that object is. And finally, if we um, uh, activate this rapidly adapting receptor, well, we might feel it's a tapping of a, of a pencil, or we're holding something like a, um, a, a drill or a, a, a electric saw that's vibrating. So all this stuff we learn from experience. Now, let's look at texture for a moment. Um, try rubbing on, on, on your shirt, and, and, and you can feel how the texture of your shirt, or the table, the texture of the table. Now try just putting your fingers down on either your shirt or your table. And you'll notice that that sense of texture is gone. It's there when your fingers move, but it's gone when they uh, are stay stationary. So texture, uh, it, it requires the activation of those rapidly adapting receptors on the skin surface. Okay. The skin surface uh, allows detailed small receptor, small receptor field objects, but also uh, it has to be, you have to rub across it to keep reactivating that rapidly adapting receptor. Okay, so where does that signal go? Well, one the main pathway is called the dorsal column medial lumbiscal system. Uh, it's a long name, but basically because the afferent come, let's say this is the afferent from the, this is the cell body, it goes into the spinal cord and up to something called the medulla, which is about the neck level, the lower neck level and into a nucleus called the dorsal column nucleus. There it makes a synapse and then crosses over to the other side of the brain and travels down a pathway called the medial lumbiscus. And that's why it's called the dorsal column medial lumbiscus system. Here it's going along the dorsal column, which is 
the dorsal uh, is the back of your spinal cord. So this is your spinal cord here, and this is the its back on the back side of it. And it goes up to the thalamus, makes a connection as the eye did, and then goes into the cortex. Um, in this case, what the primary somatosensory cortex, okay, as the, the, the vision did for the eye. Okay? It went to the primary visual cortex. So this is, if this is a, an RA1 receptor, this is a pathway with this RA1 receptor. It's its private line to the arm area uh, in the cortex. Now, again, this is the spinal cord, this is the dorsal column, and you can see as you go from the leg level to the trunk level to the arm leg level, it's getting wider and wider. But it's not, these fibers aren't mixing. The ones here for the leg stay here in the medial side, the middle of it, and these fibers that enter uh, stay in the middle here, and these ones that enter last stay on the outside, the lateral side of the spinal cord. So you can see you're getting a body map being represented in your dorsal column. All of your different body parts are being laid out here. Um, okay, I think we, we've covered that pretty well. The other pathway is for pain and temperature. And that goes something along what's called the anterior lateral system. And what the difference is, the important difference is twofold. One is the axon comes in from the pain things. And rather than making its first synapse in the dorsal column, it makes its first synapse within the spinal cord itself. The other difference is that it crosses over at the level it enters the spinal cord and then travels up this other pathway back to the thalamus and back to the same arm area that the other fiber came from. So you've got all, all, the, all the fibers from the, the, all the touch and pain and temperature fibers coming from the arm area, going to the arm area represent, represented in your primary somatosensory cortex. Now, what happens in the dorsal column, why, why, why have a synapse there? Well, it does something. Um, it somehow changes something. It's not just a synapse, uh, a relay nucleus. It, it, and we'll see it does three things um, that are important uh, for the processing of information. One thing it does is convergence. So function one is convergence. You can see here there's an afferent coming from the skin on your back. And as you can see here, there's one, two, three, four, five, six afferents, five afferents, um, coming together at into onto one dorsal column nucleus, nuclear cell. Uh, and so this is a large convergence. Many fibers are coming onto one cell. In contrast, from your fingertip, you have each fiber going to just one neuron in the dorsal column, okay? 
And so you can tell that your fingertips are going to be able to measure detail while the uh, skin on your back isn't going to have that ability to measure detail. The other thing you can tell is that the fingertip will have a big representation in your dorsal column and the skin on your back will have a small representation. And you can test that yourself uh, by uh, taking like a paper clip and pressing the two ends against the, uh, your, your, the skin on your fingertip and the finger or on your forearm. And you'll see your ability to measure the distance between when they're close together or far apart far better on your fingertip and also on your lips and your tongue. So you can you can know from that that the fingertip will have a large representation and your lips and your tongue will also. Now the other function, another function of the dorsal column is sort of it producing this inhibitory surround that we saw um, cells f for, from the eye having. Okay? You have um, afferents in the middle producing uh, a positive effect on, on the neuron, whereas cells in the surround having a negative effect. But this the afferents themselves don't have an inhibitory surround, okay? Just the neurons in your dorsal column look to this. But you have to go way up into the, the, your neck to, be, have, to get that um, inhibitory surround effect. And like in vision, this accentuates edges. So when you feel an edge on your tabletop or uh, when you touch your mouse. Um, it's that, this inhibitory surround that's producing that accentuation of those edges. Now, um, I don't know if you've ever tried to tickle yourself. Uh, you'll find that you're not very good at tickling yourself. But if another person tickles you, it works. Why is that? Well, that's because of a third function of the dorsal column. It produces gaiety. So whenever you produce a movement yourself, okay, it inhibits the dorsal column nuclear cells, okay? And that inhibition then, um, uh, reduces your sensation from that particular aspect. So one, one useful thing from that is that when you make a movement, you activate a whole bunch of afferents, but you, you, you may not care about feeling that movement, okay? Uh, and, and, and you might want to uh, limit how much afferent information is coming up. It's the unexpected that, uh, that, that you want to feel, not the uh, expected afferent information. So we have three different transformations occurring within the dorsal column nucleus. And this, is, this synapse does things. It uh, produces convergence, so different body parts have different sizes of representation. It produces this inhibition surround, which accentuates edges, and it has this polar discharge inhibition, which gates uh, some of the input coming up. Okay, then we get to the cortex itself. And one of the main things about it 
is its distorter. We we saw we've already know that at, at, as, as we went up to the dorsal column, the different parts of the dorsal column will have uh, different sizes of representation for different body parts. We saw that the fingertips ha had a large representation. This is the forearm here. It has a much smaller representation, as does the leg. Uh, the lips have a large representation as does the tongue over here. So this is, uh, on, on the medial side of the brain, this is the face and the tongue here is on the lateral side of the brain. This whole structure here is just behind the central sulcus. Okay. Now, Sometimes there, you have things like phantom limbs. So, for example, there was a, in, in, in an article there was a report of a patient who was amputated, uh, lost his arm up to the shoulder. And a year after that amputation, the patient had the sensation uh, of his hand coming from his cheek, okay? hand sensations from a limb that wasn't there, uh, whenever coming from his, the cheek area. And what, what seems to have happened there is that when the person lost his arm, that representation of his arm became smaller and smaller. At the same time, his cheek area, his face area, took over representation of the arm area, but you still have to have this little tiny island of arm representation left in the cheek area. What this then tells us that, that unlike the visual system, there's a lot of plasticity in your sense of touch, even in adulthood. Now, we've got not one representation of the body in, 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 in this region, but actually four. Uh, we have uh, an area called 3A, which we'll study in more detail next week, and it tells us about what's happening underneath the skin, what's happening with the, the muscles and the joints. And it tells you where your body parts are, where your uh, elbow is relative to um, uh, your, the rest of your upper arm, uh, where your fingers are with respect to your wrist. Um, so all that is Again, all your body parts are coded here, but the information that's coming in is, is where your limbs are. The ones we're talking, going to talk about today, this area 3B, um, is the information that's coming from the surface of the skin, your sense of touch. And these two areas are the primary set the sensory area, S1, like V1. So the two areas here are like V1. The other two areas, area 1 and area 2, are like uh, V2 and V3. Okay? They're higher order areas. But again, you have all the body parts represented in them. The other thing, um, well, yeah, I just mentioned that. The other thing uh, to notice is the mirroring. This hand that you see here, its mirror image is located here. Okay? So this part of the hand is the mirror image. Uh, so cells here, 
this part of the hand are close to cells that are in this part of the hand. You're putting things close together again. And this is like the retinotopic mirroring that you saw in V1 and V2. Now, um, the other thing is that these, what are these two areas here? This one here receives information primarily from those rapidly adapting re receptors on the skin surface. RA1 signifies it's coming from the surface, and RA is, is, is that it's rapidly adapting. So those, these are the afferents that are important for texture. So this area here is specializes in texture. This area here uh, receives information from your slowly adapting um, receptors deeper in the skin. And those are the receptors that are good at telling whether or not you know, like your fingers are stretched or compressed and they give you the sense of position that, that's useful for um, figuring out what the shape of objects are. The other thing that's important is that these early areas, like the early areas in the visual cortex, have circular surround receptor fields like you have the dorsal column nucleus. In these higher order areas, you have um, these more complicated receptor fields like your, your complex cells that have an orientation uh, specificity and also uh, have a sense of motion. The other thing that they have that's different is that the, the, their receptive fields can span several fingers. So they have large receptive fields uh, and co these complicated uh, orientation sensitive, movement sensitive receptive fields. And from there, the information f flows back here to the parietal cortex. And this is where something called stereognosis occurs. And this is where uh, you over there were able to judge what the object was. So this is the, the area that it allowed you to identify what all is it for the texture information, the shape information, all this information together and say, aha, that's what we have here. Now, if you look at um, area 3B in even more detail, one finds, again, you have columns, like, like we saw uh, in other parts of the cortex. But what's different here is that each column is receiving information from only one type of receptor. So this is this label, the end of this labeled line that uh, um, we, we saw began in, in the afferent itself. So if it's a, a, a receptor that's um, RA1, one that's useful for texture, it's this column that lights up. If it's this one here, uh, a slowly adapting deep in the skin, it's this column here that would be activated. Okay, that ends what we're going to talk about touch. And we'll move on to taste. Uh, taste and, in a moment, smell are your chemical senses. And they're important in distinguishing between foods that are nutritious and those that are harmful, and also things that are a pleasure to eat or not. Uh, the tongue is, of course, it's a, has a skin surface like any other skin surface, 
and so it has a sense of touch, temperature, pain, as the thumb is. But it's also able, in, in addition, to do a chemical analysis of substances that are dissolved in your saliva. And it has four or five basic tastes that it can um, measure through chemical analysis of. And that's bitter, sour, salty, sweet, and umami. Now, each sorry, uh, basic taste has a slightly different representation. There's lots of overlap, but um, sweet and salty is most, uh, uh, most of the receptors are located at the front of the tongue, whereas bitter is represented in the back of the tongue and things that are sour in between. And also, the middle of the tongue, for some reason, is less sensitive as than the far edges to these various tastes. tastes. Now, the other thing that, that's important is that when you take a sip of something, like wine, uh, you as, as the wine enters, it activates these first, so you have the sense of a sweetness, and then a little bit later, how sour it is, and whether or not it's bitter. So you have this temporal signal that's traveling down to the brain. And it's this temporal signal that helps you identify what the substance, what the flavor is. Now, um, sourness and saltiness have, uh, uh, have receptors that just measure uh, sort of the, the like ion channels. They, they allow ions in, and uh, in this case, um, um, H plus or Na plus, the, the terms how much saltiness is. This tells you whether it's uh, sour or not. These other uh, tastes um, use something called G protein coupled receptor, and they uh, activate a sort of a second messenger, which um, also occurs in the eye to be able to measure um, what, what the activation of a single photon of light. Uh, umami, uh, uh, up to about 10 years ago, people thought there was only four basic things. Recently, they found there's a fifth. Um, and it's something like uh, the taste of monosodium glutamate. Uh, and it, it's what gives you sort of the, the taste of bacon or something savory. Now, each receptor is like a, 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 um, so, uh, something like a lock that accepts a particular key. Um, some receptors, for example, uh, are, are, are for, look for the shape of glucose. And when a glucose mo molecule appears, it opens these receptors and you recognize it as, 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 as uh, glucose or, or other receptors to recognize sweetness. And uh, the, the sweetness uh, is, is a big business in terms of trying to create molecules that activate that receptor but don't have any calories to it. Okay? So you, you, the industry has figured out ways of making molecules that look like sugar molecules but don't have uh can't be broken down into a sugar by 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 your digestive system 
Now, these receptors are located on taste buds that are placed in, in the, on the tongue. And um, each taste bud has maybe a hundred different cells. Each one of these will be most sensitive to one particular taste. But because uh, the tongue is uh, located in a place that, that, that's uh, very, very, uh, not a safe place to be. Um, these receptors get damaged. You drink something scalding hot, you know. Well, that, that's going to damage these receptors. But luckily, they're being replaced. There's a continuous process of replacing these receptors. You have out here something called the basal cell. These basal cells become supporting cells, and these supporting cells eventually turn into taste cells. And this occurs continuously over about a two-week lifespan. So over a two-week period, this cycle will, will occur. This cell will become this cell, will become this cell. The other thing that the, 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 these taste buds need is this afric uh, being in contact with these cells. If this afric is damaged or cut, these taste cells will degenerate. Now, from the tongue, these cells take from different parts of the tongue. These cells go to different parts of this thing called the nucleus of the solitary tract. They in turn go to the thalamus, and that in turn goes to a part of the cortex that's called the insular taste cortex. And there you have a, sort of a rough somatic representation of the tongue. Now, um, the tongue, like uh, for taste, um, uses the same thing that um, touch uses. It uses sort of a labeled line system to learn uh, what, what, what diff the different receptor activations represent. Now we have an inborn hunger. We like things that are of nutritious value. So um, we, we like, we need salt because salts contain sodium and potassium, things that are important for producing action potentials. Uh, we need um, proteins. Uh, so umami is very effective in, 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 in detecting proteins. Uh, we have sweetness receptors that, that produce, allow us to um, uh, generate calories. Um, so we have uh, the, the, this sort of inborn um, system for craving certain, uh, certain substances. And it's surprising what these cravings can produce. So, at the beginning of the century, there were a lot of children being poisoned, uh, getting, getting lead poisoning. And the reason for that was that these children suffered from a calcium deficiency. And, and they had this uh, urge to eat the plaster in the walls of, of most uh, rooms, you know. Uh, uh, the the, uh, the 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 um, underneath the paint is um, a substance that's loaded with calcium. Unfortunately, those uh, in those days the paint was also loaded with lead, and as a consequence, they got lead poisoning.
also one has can have genetic defects. Um, these receptors uh, are, ha are powered by genes, and you can have uh, deficiencies in these genes, and you can have an inability to sense certain flavors. Uh, for example, some many people can't detect some of the bitterness found in cabbage. And some people found, find the bitterness to be overpowering and dislike cabbage. You also have learned aversions to taste. Um, I remember overeating on honey. And uh, as a consequence, I developed a, an aversion for eating honey as a little kid. Um, and animals can, can learn um, to be, have a, an aversion. Um, and people put, used to put poisons in um, food to get rid of rats. And uh, this po tasted, uh, this, this, this uh, tasteless poison uh, got associated with the food that the rat was eating, and the rat would then avoid that particular food. And that aversion uh, could last a lifetime. I remember I, I still have trouble with it. So I had, had overate the honey as a little kid, and I still have a, a, an aversion for, for honey now. But it's interesting that, that, that it's not like classical condition. So if you go to a, a restaurant, um, you can eat a particular food, and if it's not properly cooked or something, you get nausea from that food. But it's not associated with everything else. It's just uh, the food itself that you get an aversion for, not the music that was being played or the person that you were with that day. Now, the other sense of, that's important is the sense of smell. Here we have the nasal cavity, and in it little odorants coming in and then um, being absorbed uh, by uh, the mucus that, that, that covers the top of your nasal cavity. Now, the combination of smell and taste is what gives f food its flavor. Okay, um, you need the combination of both to have an expression of flavor in the brain. And um, as you become old, your sense of smell uh, often becomes less acute, and as a consequence, you don't eat as much. You don't have the sense of flavor, and uh, you can become suffer weight loss. Now, most odors, um, like uh, perfumes, are a complex mixture of molecules. Um, the perfume industry spends millions trying to find combinations of molecules that have particular odors to them. Um, and they come in, uh, each, each molecule, these are little molecules coming in, and they uh, sort of di diffuse through this, this uh, mucus that's on the nasal cavity and attach themselves to one of these receptors. So you notice that each of these that come in the nasal cavity have a certain shape and they get attached to a certain receptor shape, this lock and key. Now these um, receptors are called olfactory cells and they connect onto mitral cells 
and each microcell uh, is has has a, the same receptor type, and they in turn are um, located in this thing called the olfactory bulb, which is actually part of your cortex. So it's, it's an extension of your cortex. This is your skull here, and these the little tiny fibers are going through your skull. And you can imagine that if there's a sudden impact like of your skull, uh, the, your brain will go forward. It's a soft substance, but your skull is a hard substance. As a consequence, these uh, afferents can get damaged and you can, for a time, lose your sense of smell. But luckily, like in the case sense of taste, these efforts regrow and your sense of taste reestablishes itself or smell reestablishes itself. Now after that, uh, the, the signal travels to these structures, this, this particular structure called the amygdala uh, is where you have a sense of pleasure or, or uh, aversion to taste. The hippocampus is part of a brain that establishes your memory or, of, of the particular taste. And then it travels to this orbital frontal cortex where uh, taste and smell are, com or smell and uh, um, the, the information from the tongue are combined give you this sense of flavor. Uh, okay, we covered that. So the, again, the orbital frontal cortex is where we combine the odors with the taste. And also things like the texture. Uh, your tongue can uh, determine the texture of food. Um, just use your skin can. Um, and you can have spiciness, which is those pain fibers coming from your tongue. Uh, and vision, you can have, you see things before you eat them. So all those things give you this perception of flavor, and all that gets combined here in the orbital front of the cortex. So these cells have a multimodal input that is coming from different afferent, um, um, afferent um, modalities, uh, smell, sight, taste. And if you have a lesion here, you have um, an inability to discriminate orders and tastes. Now, the axons here are, the axon here, that can get damaged by um, uh, concussion or impact on the brain, um, are, are unmyelinated. But that's not important because um, speed is not an essence of your taste of smell. It takes time for these molecules to diffuse through this, this mucus here, and it takes, so it could take time for um, it, it, it to travel down this unmyelinated fiber. Again, um, you can imagine that, uh, as in the case of uh, taking a sip of wine, how different, different uh, parts of the tongue get activated at different times. When you take a sniff, different molecules entered at different times, and that those molecules can then in turn activate these fibers um, uh, in, at different moments. And that pattern over time 
um, is what uh, the brain senses and has to code as a particular smell. So the memory of, of a taste involves time as well. Now, are there basic smell qual qualities? We said we had uh, a, a finite number of taste cells, a finite number of touch cells, a finite number of cone types. But it, instead, it, in, in the case of uh, smell, we've got hundreds, and uh, other species have thousands of receptor types. I've just drawn three here, three different colors, but in humans, we probably have hundreds uh, uh, available. And so um, these are distributed uh, in, in, onto different microcells. And, uh, and so in here, on the olfactory bulb, we sort of have um, a, a sense of taste being mapped out by the different receptor types. Now, here are, is an example of an odor, like, like a particular perfume, and it's composed of odorants, different molecules, and each one has different shapes. And the receptor cells have like different shapes of receptors, and each of these can fit into one of these receptors. The interesting thing is that sometimes these receptors can fit, uh, th these, these odorants can fit a number of receptors depending on which part of them are touching. So this here can go into this square type of receptor, but this end can go into a round type of receptor. So you, you can activate one single order and, or molecule can activate um, more than one receptor type. So a particular smell then is a combination of these orderings and this in turn activates pattern of these microcells that are represented here um, in the olfactory bulb. Again, you could have genetic defects, so they can produce different, like color blindness, different uh, uh, smell blindness called inosmia, an odd name. So again, the, the different smells are mapped out here in the olfactory bulb. And um, each one has a different sort of genetic uh, subtype. So this one here is one genetic subtype. This one here is another genetic subtype. And so if you've got a some gene difficulty, you might miss this one, but not this one. Uh, similar uh, orders activate um, similar uh, bunches of receptor microcells. So one smell might be mapped here, another smell might be mapped here. But again, um, you don't have um, a somatotopy of the olfactory bulb. Like, so, so, so this olfactory bulb isn't somatically mapped onto the, uh, this part of the nasal cavity isn't somatically mapped onto the olfactory bulb. Instead, smells are mapped. On, on the olfactory bulb. Uh, 
again, um, as in taste, these these uh, receptors can can get damaged uh, because uh, viruses can enter these cells and and damage them. Uh, you get colds, uh, and so they again being constantly replaced. But the neat thing about it is that if this cell, like this receptor, gets damaged, a new receptor is developed and it goes back to the very same place that it was originally. So this mapping here in the in these microcells in the factory bulbs aren't changed, the same mapping occurs throughout life, even though these are constantly being replaced. So finally, then, um, we have uh, both olfactory cells and taste cells are constantly being replaced. The other thing that's important is that both enter the, the, the newer cerebral cortex. Uh, so the, that's, this is the new cortex, and this is the part that, that smell come, enters to. And this is the part that taste enters to. But the, both also enter the, an older part called the limbic system. And that's involved in things like memory and uh, your sense of pleasure, uh, which is the amygdala. And hunger as well, the hypothalamus. So that's it for today.